Well, on November 19th, Michael Anderson was the bartender at Club Q in Colorado Springs when Anderson Lee Aldridge walked in and killed five people and 25 others were injured. It reminded the LGBTQ plus community of Orlando's Pulse nightclub shooting. Uh, we want to welcome you to Unapologetically Queer. I'm your host, Al Ferguson, and I am proud to talk to some of the most interesting people that are inspiring to our LGBTQ plus community, talking about what the concerns are of our LGBTQ plus community. Well, today, as we know, growing anti-LGBTQ plus politics of hate can be a dog whistle to those who wish to commit violence. The most dramatic example is what happened last fall at Club Q in Colorado Springs. What happened on November 19th and then into November 20th last year will leave a forever scar on our hearts. The mass shooting occurred at Club Q, an LGBTQ plus nightclub in Colorado Springs. As I said, five people were killed, 25 others were injured, 19 of them by gunfire. The accused was a 22-year-old Anderson Lee Aldrich. And joining us uh, this evening on Unapologetically Queer is uh, the owner of uh, Club Q, uh, Matthew Haynes. He's the founder. And also Michael Anderson, the Club Q bartender and shooting survivor, who is now the vice president of operations for Club Q. He represented, well, I should say both of them represented us when they testified before Congress on the rising danger and violence against uh, LGBTQ plus ple uh, people. So uh, Matthew Haynes and Michael Anderson, uh, I understand first off, let's get it right off the table. You both are unapologetically queer. We are. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Unapologetic. <laughs> uh, and, and apparently for a long time, you've been queer, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, we, uh, we appreciate uh, uh, you joining us, uh, to both of you, Matthew and Michael. It's been six months since the gay nightclub shooting. Uh, let me begin with the two of you of how you're doing. How are you two personally doing? That's a, that, that, that's a daily that, that, that's a daily question and it can change you know with with the ups and the downs we're, we're so fortunate for all of the support we've had from across the country really across the world um, and and so we draw upon that on our down days but there that there are that there are certainly ups and certainly downs uh, re rebuilding this get, getting you know into the memorial I mean all of this is, has been very very difficult uh, for us um, but we, we have a team of folks here uh, in Colorado Springs that, that are working Working on this daily, you know, 12, 15 hours a day, and, and so I think we, we we get a lot of strength from that mm -hmm. from yeah. our team. And Michael, uh, you were there. Matthew, were you in the club uh, the night of the shooting? I I didn't read. I was that. not. I was actually I was just headed home from dinner. Uh, we were supposed to be at the club, uh, so I was there about six minutes directly after the shooting. I got yeah. a phone call from one of our employees as it's as it was happening um and so we immediately went there so i was there directly thereafter yeah and michael you were in the club you were bartender uh that night i understand how are you doing um yes i was uh, bartending uh that night um you know it's been six months and we just had a sort of remembrance ceremony outside the club on the six month mark may 19th and um you know, it's it's still very raw. I think everybody here is still very much in the weeds of processing this and navigating this. But for me, I've used a lot of uh, therapeutic resources and and mental health. Being in the office here with other people who went through this as we work through this together, both in terms of the business, but also there's a lot of personal bits that help us as well. You know, one of the things I know both of you know, um, uh, those that have been exposed to gun violence. Um, it's not the in, it's not just the individuals that directly experience the gun violence. It's everyone around you, uh, family, friends, and community. Uh, Colorado Springs. How is uh, the LGBTQ plus community in Colorado Springs? How are they doing today? Um, it's, it's, it's tremendous. And and whether you were in Club 
Q that night, whether you had been to Club Q the week before or the day before, or there's some that were there hours before, it's impacted everybody because Club Q for the last 20 years has been that place that, that everybody has come in and out of for various times, celebrated their birthdays or celebrated other events and met their partners. It, it's just been that, that hub of the community and that piece of consistency. And it would be, Michael often says, it, it's that the place that when something like this would have ha happened, that's where we went. When Pulse happened, we were outside, everyone was at Club Q. We were there with, you know, candlelight vigils that evening. And, and, and you know, we, the community came together there. And suddenly that space was gone and where do you go? Mm -hmm. And so as a community in whole, grieving, hurting, angry, all of the phases of, uh, of grief are, are, are prevalent and at a different phases, and everyone is grieving differently within you know, the community. It's, it's interesting to me because uh, I've read a lot about Colorado Springs. Colorado's interesting. I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in our studios in Florida, and most of the world says Florida is really, really an interesting place, and frequently not for good reasons. Um, Colorado uh, seems to be a little bit of a different bet, but in Colorado Springs, I've read a lot about embracement uh, of the LGBTQ community. You have been the only bar you opened after the only bar closed uh, 20, uh, uh, now uh, 21 years ago. Um, uh, let's talk about Club Q and the LGBTQ community in Colorado Springs. For those viewers that don't know, uh, Colorado has been a state getting better and better on diversity. Uh, but in Florida, as I said, we hear Colorado described as the good and the bad. You're a, a state in transition. For example, Colorado has a gay governor. Now, think about Ron DeSantis and apply a standard of gay in front of him. It would be very, very different. Uh, they have a gay governor named Jared Polis. But simultaneously, they have a congresswoman that is a radical Republican like Laura Lauren Boebert. And she has said some of the most hateful language in America uh, from Congress about the LGBTQ community. Uh, I have heard the same mixed issues uh, exist in Colorado Springs. Michael, Matthew, is, do we get this correct that Colorado Springs is is not a hateful community, but it also hasn't been a great embracing community. Or you correct that record. What what's the truth about the community of Colorado Springs? I'm going to ask that uh, question, and we'll uh, piece. So don't worry about it at all. But my question okay. um, uh, was: Is it true about Colorado Springs? Is it a community that um, uh, is difficult for the LGBTQ community, or is it changing, or is it evolving? What is it? It's definitely changing. It's definitely changing. Um, 20 years ago when we opened Club Q, we were not a very affirming community. And even the day before the shooting, I would have questioned how far have we come. Um, the day after the shooting, it was tremendous from the, the support we received from the police department, from the mayor's office, for obviously from the state level with the, the governor. Um, it, 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 it just, I was very proud of Colorado Springs, how far we've come, how much respect we were shown as, as a community. So, so we've, we've persevered over the last 20 years. And, and I, I think that, that Colorado Springs has come a long way. And we, we also see that in our most recent mayor election uh, with, the, with the election of Yemi, who is a, you know, a very um, um, moderate um, person and, and, and is looking and, and ran on inclusion. And so, so I, I think we can be proud of Colorado Springs, but we certainly have not had that reputation in the past. And that's certainly why Club Q has existed for 20 years. Michael, I'm curious as, um, as a bartender and employee working in the bar, and now you're a VP of operations uh, working with uh, Matthew and Club Q. Um, when the bar reopens this fall, uh, do you think uh, uh, its prominence, uh, respect, uh, et cetera, in the Colorado Springs community will be different than prior to the shooting? Yeah, I think that Club Q today has gone from, you know, one of Colorado Springs' oldest LGBT clubs to now being a sacred and holy space for the community. 
it's got a lot more um, just, you know, personality to it and history to it that it didn't have before. It's not just a gathering point now, it's also a memorial to what has happened at that building. And so I think it's going to be very different from what it was before um, for the community. But I, for us, I mean, I can tell you, we both miss the space very much. And I know there's many people in our community who are very eager to get back there because there really isn't another place to go that's like Club Q here in Colorado Springs. So, you know, I think that this just carries on with its with its story. And, and this is certainly part of the story that I never hoped would ever you know, enter into existence or reality, but, you know, it has now. So, you know, here we are just trying to navigate that. I'm curious to has- um, both of you about dates. Uh, for me, June 12th, I'm in Florida, obviously. For me, June 12th, 2016 is a date that uh, will shudder with me forever. It has every single year. It continues. As America knows, at 2.02 a.m., a gunman walked into Orlando's Pulse nightclub and began a nightmare of 49 murders. Uh, as I think a lot of viewers know, RuPaul's Drag Races at Sea director, uh, who worked for me, Edward Topat Eddy, uh, sent a text that the shooting had started and a video on the dance floor just minutes before the shots rang out. Uh, as he was playing uh, on the dance floor. Uh, uh, Eddie is actually in the background there. Uh, that was his boyfriend, Lewis, with the top hat. And Eddie's text was, uh, his people were here. And he was talking about the Latin night that was going on at Pulse. Uh, for four agonizing hours, the nightmare at Pulse continued. And the morning of June 12th, I was at the ORMC Crisis Center at 10 a.m. and. His was the first name announced to be lost. And next week, I will go to Orlando Gay Days, uh, meet with the One Pulse Foundation, and go to the Pulse Nightclub Memorial for its seventh anniversary. Michael and and Matthew, I'm curious, uh, you have a permanent date now on your calendar, and very likely forever. Tell me what the date uh, will mean to you as, as time goes on. That, that that's a really difficult question. Um, as you know, especially we've just uh, marked the the six month anniversary. Obviously, that that date, those times, those hours. Um, sometimes they feel like they were just yesterday. Sometimes they feel like they were five years ago. Um, but for us, it it is because it's twofold. It, it it's the horrific tragedy. It's the horrific things that happened there. You know, we were assaulted with an assault weapon. The person gained entry within two seconds within two seconds of um we, we we had our first fatalities and our first injuries and then you know this that this happened for such a short period of time but what it also is is it's, it's about it's about a rebirth it's about people in that club took action and there were two folks and it took two of them um this yeah was i'm gonna a large you there because i want i want to i want to focus on that uh, in greater detail um, I, I'm, I'm curious in terms of, you haven't been to your first anniversary uh, yet of November 19th. Uh, interesting, from my perspective, I'm getting ready to celebrate the 7th um, uh, of gun mass violence against our community. You're, you're getting ready uh, in, in six months to celebrate your first. Is it, do you think it's something um, as a calendar date uh, that you will ever just go, okay, I accept, and November 19th is just something that I can accept. Uh, Michael, do you think you'll just get to the point where you accept it? I, I don't think so. I mean, for me and so many others in the club that night, that was the most horrific night of our lives. And I just don't, I can't imagine there'll be one day where November 19th is just another November 19th. It, that that day holds such significance now, particularly being on the eve of the Transgender Day of Remembrance. That holiday as well will also uh, never be a, a regular thing to me because we lost my coworker who was transgender that night. Yeah, and so oh, I bring those two things together. I, I want to bring that up. I, I I do want to take a moment to talk about what happened on November nineteenth and explore it a little because I think one of the great stories, unfortunately, is is what actually happened 
as this was happening. Uh, and I want to ask you about it, not because I want to focus on the sensational of the shooting, um, but because I know describing Pulse uh, to thousands of people uh, helped them in preparing of the what if, if they faced something like what happened at Pulse, and I imagine very uh, similar to uh, Club Q, facing the unimaginable. So first off, uh, Michael, for you, you're behind the bar. Um, it's a few minutes before midnight. Kind of give us what the moment was like for you. Yeah, um, that shift that night, I started around 8 p.m., clocked into work, just any other Saturday night shift. I knew it would be busy. Um, or assumed it would be busy and, and we'd be, you know, having a good time as we normally did on the weekends with, with my coworkers and with the community present. But um, yeah, I was doing my job uh, for about four hours and then in the middle of pouring a drink and serving one of our regular customers, I just started hearing the rapid firing of uh, gunfire going off. And at first I didn't recognize, I suppose, what that was, or maybe you hope in your head that it's not what you you're hearing it might, there must be something else maybe the speaker's blown or or maybe someone's got a fan and they're clacking it very loudly um but when i looked up uh at the entry to the club i i saw actual gunfire coming out of the gun and at that point i understood that a nightmare was unfolding before me that i had never hoped uh that i would ever go through or, or club q would ever go through um, and the next five minutes were, were horrific. I mean, for everybody in there, um, Michael, did you, losing know, five people. Uh, did you know, as you're standing by in the bar and you begin to realize what is going on, did you know that a mass tragedy was getting ready to unfold? Did you process it that quickly? Well, I'll, I will tell you, um, that I did live in Orlando during the pulse shooting. I'm actually from Florida myself. Um, and, um, you know, I, I I understood that mass violence and mass shootings are common in this country, um, far too common. And you know, once I saw the the gunfire and the you know, w once I realized what was happening very quickly, I in my head I, I recognized it as a mass shooting. I, I realized that someone was coming into our my job and our safe space and trying to kill uh, as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Michael, I read, of course, it's widely been reported, it was an AR-15, it's basically a machine gun. Um, when you start to hear that AR-15 uh, and, and the popping noise as fast as it is, is moving, I'm just curious, from your first-hand account, you, you're, you're unique in that you are an employee of Club Q and you're also present at Club Q. When you start to hear that AR-15, what was your reaction about the noise that you were hearing and the speed that you were hearing it? Yeah, um, you know, it, when you hear that, you know, like I said, I, you, uh, many people didn't recognize it as a gun at first, you know, maybe it could have been something else, but to hear the rapid firing of, of a gun like that is terrifying. It's absolutely horrific because that that is firing off at a speed of which if you don't think quickly within the matter of seconds you could be dead that's how quickly this this happens that's how quickly this gun can fire off and that's a horrific thought so i i had to act very quickly and and duck behind the bar um and i'm glad i did at the speed that i did because if i hadn't reacted as quickly as i had i may not be here yeah, doing this I interview, be, interview I with be you talking right now. to you you know one other thing and and you all have mentioned it already but i i want to draw attention to it uh, this was on the eve of uh, Transgender Day of Remembrance. We did a pr big program here at uh, Happening Hotspots Magazine, happening out here in South Florida, as you can imagine. Um, irony of so much uh, to this story, uh, because one of the victims uh, was a bar supervisor, Daniel Aston. Um, I didn't know until this moment that uh, identification of trans. Anything you want to say about? Uh, Daniel and the, the loss of uh, Daniel? D Daniel is an amazing individual. Um, he, he arrived from Tulsa and immediately 
embraced Club Q uh, during, and, and he shared his transitioning journey with with all of us. And so for me personally, getting to know Daniel over the, that two year period that he worked with us helped me with understanding fully how a trans person feels. Um, we remember when he had his top surgery and uh, and he was just so excited to be able to have the, the scarring heal and to be able to go topless for the first time. And, 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 and but both of those, if you're showing on the, the, the screen there, both both Derek and, and Daniel were was just certainly the heart and the life of Club Q. No matter what your day was like, no matter what had happened to you, you walked into Club Q, you were greeted with a massive smile by all of our bar staff, you were greeted with a hug. It just made your day. And um, his journey was was amazing, and he's, he's changed so many hearts and minds and, and, and influenced so many people. And continues yeah. to do so even even in death. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to to highlight somebody from the trans community and uh, senseless uh, gun mm -hmm. violence. I want to zero in, as I said, one uh, as as somebody connected with Pulse, losing an employee that was so nationally visible uh, as Top Hat Eddie for RuPaul's uh, Drag Race um, Drag Stars at Sea. When June twelfth. Uh, 2016 happened. We, I don't think, were prepared for an event like Pulse. It, it, I, it's just, it was unimaginable to us. Six years later, sadly, we assume it was possible. We assume the possibility. That's how much worse it's gotten over uh, the last six years yes. of gun violence in America. Something happened at Club Q that we talked about extensively at Queer News tonight. Uh, something that was unique that did not happen at Pulse. A club patron, you've, um, uh, we want to talk about him. A club patron, U.S. Army veteran Richard M. Fierro, uh, charged um, across the room and tackled the shooter uh, as it began. So we're, we've already described, it's an AR-15, shots are happening so fast it's almost unbelievable the speed uh, of the of the military weapon that is being used, and uh, Fierro charges across the room and tackles the shooter to the ground, causing the rifle to fall out of reach. Reports say, uh, witnesses say, Fierro then grabbed a handgun from the shooter's hand and used it to hit the shooter repeatedly in the head. Fierro was assisted by two other patrons that he had uh, recruited in help, including Thomas James, who moved the rifle away to safety, and a trans woman who used her high heels to stomp on the shooter, and who helped disable and hold the shooter down until authorities uh, arrived. Amazing. Michael, Matthew, did I get all of these facts correct? Um, just a slight correction. So Thomas James was the initial person to charge the shooter. The shooter um, was stepping onto our patio and Thomas, uh, who is an active Navy um, uh, person, um, saw that, that the patio basically was, was full of people and uh, he grabbed a trash can lid and basically as the shooter was uh, was stepping onto the patio, he grabbed the weapon. They started fighting. Thomas was actually shot during that fight, at which time um, Rich was making it his way across the, the club and was able then to tackle down and actually bring down um, the the shooter, and then it was a it was a team effort from then on. And you know what I've said from we we if those two people had not been there, had Thomas not taken that action, had Rich not been there, and you know being able to be the sort of size that the guy was, uh, that this would have ended up with the same sort of uh, numbers that that you saw in Pulse. Uh, this person came in with you know illegal sixty round clips. Um, in, in then 30 round clips um, and his intent was to kill everyone in there and then of course all the wounded we have we had so many wounded because he didn't have an opportunity to go back and and kill those as well so for for everything going wrong that within less than one minute 
we had people standing up in this community and saying, you're not going to do this. You're not. And uh, that, you know, when Thomas got shot doing it, Rich got injured, but yes. It, and then it, it was a, it was a team effort, you know, even with the, the trans individual coming in at the end. And that was finally what got the, the gentleman from, you know, withering around and trying not to to get up we later found out he also had an improvised um, um, hand grenade that he had made from a flashbang and had put shrapnel in it and he you can see on the videos him reaching for that he uh, you know he, he also had a nine millimeter uh, with him as well and that's the one that rich was able to disarm and thankfully that jammed so so many things went in our favor even though we lost you know, five people in this horrific thing. But from what I always say is from the minute that Thomas and Rich um, and our trans individual took action, we took back control. We lost control for less than that one minute when that hate was prominent. And then from then on, uh, you know, we, we were in control. Um, well, I also have got to say that the police department here, they entered not knowing what was going on. They, you know, three rookie officers entered with their ARs the minute that they arrived. And they were ready to, you know, to do battle and put their lives at risk. So, so overall, everything that could go right once this incident started did go right. Um, had he made it to the patio, Michael was hiding on the patio, and, and so were many others, there easily would have been another, you know, the FBI, and we estimate at least another 30 to 40 deaths. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> harrowing, especially from my, my knowledge and understanding of Pulse. Um, Michael, help us understand in in the bar uh, at the approaching the stroke of midnight. Approximately, the total number of people in Club Q was how many people? Approximately, staff, patrons, entertainers. Right. I believe it was about fifty people. Yeah, fifty to sixty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fifty fifty people. And honestly, by the point of the shooting, it was it had slowed down quite a bit from the earlier drag show. Um, so I, that's another thing that went right was the timing. Um, just minutes before the shooting, me and my coworker Derek had a long line at the bar that we were uh, having to serve, you know, as quickly as possible. Of course, that's just how we do it. But we were able to cut that line down significantly um, right uh, before the shooter entered the club, and yeah. all those people were standing at the most deadly uh, portion of the club itself. So that went right as well, not having all those people standing there uh, right by the entryway. Yeah, the club was transitioning from a, um, from a drag show to the, the dance club. Uh, and, and Club Q has always kind of chameleed itself from, from you know, multiple venues. It's, we're just one open space. So, so the drag folks were leaving, the dance people were coming in. Um, the shooter had come an hour before uh, to case out the place and had entered and we were just packed at that point and again so many things went right and that was also his timing um, that that we were just in between this the, this this transition and at the top of the list of what you say went right in this terrible moment is something that we've talked about at pulse so many times and in reporting and conversation about club Q is that that a person and people ran toward the violence as opposed to running away right. from the violence. And that made all of the difference in the world. That is something it, it, that wasn't even considered for Pulse. Uh, uh, do you think that that's the, the principal lesson here that uh, you make your own decisions uh, of, of life at the moment, but there are people in this world that make the decision that the collective good is is more important than my the risk of my life. That's what we learned at Club Q. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have to. I mean, Th Thomas has said it uh, very, very clearly. He took action to save his friends. He took action because had that gunman made it to the uh, made it to the patio, so many more would have died. And and I, I think at that point, yes, we have to take action. I mean, we're not all carrying assault weapons. Uh, these people enter with a weapon that is designed to assault and to kill as many people as rapidly as possible. Yeah. And so running. Running becomes how much of an option is that because, you know, we had people that were shot running out the emergency exit doors. Our emergency exits are, you know, riddled with bullets. 
Um, so, so things happen so quickly. And if you think again, the, the deaths and the injuries, all of this happened in less than one minute. Um, one minute. The hero stepped in in less than one minute. So it was two seconds to penetrate our door. It was another four seconds to be able to get to our main bar area where we had most of the fatalities. And and again, you're not aiming with an AR, you're just spraying. And that's what yeah. this person was doing. Yeah. Then it was another seven or eight seconds to get down towards our dance floor. So so the, the timeline is, is just, with this sort of weapon, is just so short and the amount of damage you can do. It, and, and so literally, People just didn't have enough time to, to evacuate. And again, had Thomas and Rich and our um, Dre not acted, um, he would have been able to rampage. And, and it also took a team because you know if it was just Thomas, after Thomas was being shot, he wasn't going to be able to win that that fight. You know, and had it been just Rich, um, you know, it, it definitely took all of them. It coming together to yeah. be able to subdue a huge yeah. man that's hyped on adrenaline and 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 protected in body. Yeah, arm. you know we're uh, we're coming into June Pride Month and uh, it gives us an opportunity, a wonderful opportunity to talk to both of you and and continue to keep uh, the light on Club Q and what it means to our community. Colorado Springs Pride is coming up June 10th and 11th weekend. Uh, uh, South Florida's big uh, Pride event uh, it comes up the following weekend. Um, but Colorado Springs Pride, uh, I've just learned, uh, Rich Fierro is going to be the Grand Marshal. How fabulous is that? That's, yes, we're, we're very proud of that. He will be leading, leading the parade as, as, as well deserved as, as, as it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, our community can just be, we can just be proud of our entire community. And I'm, yeah. I'm so pleased to be able to say that. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the support that our prides had, the support that Club Q's had, um, we just, it's just phenomenal. Just you absolutely know, phenomenal. The, there's an, the old saying, it takes a village. <laughs> it seems to have taken a village here at Club Q. Uh, one of the things that I do want to point out about Rich Fierro, which uh, is, uh, is hard to accept, uh, I understand. Uh, one of those that was lost was Raymond Vance. And I understand yes. he was the boyfriend of Richard Fierro's daughter. Is that correct? That is correct. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it must and, and be it, yeah, so. It, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's it, there were so many connections there, and, mm -hmm. and uh, they, the Rich and his wife and daughter and Raymond were there supporting one of their close family friends who was performing in the drag show. Um, and so this was Raymond's first time in, in Club Q and uh, you know, was just absolutely having an amazing time, just absolutely loved it. And, and you know, and then that, that, that's the worst thing here is that so many, you know, everyone was where they wanted to be. Everyone was with the people that they loved and they wanted to be with and goes from massive smiles to within seconds, the, this horrific event. And, uh, and, and so the Fierro family and, and the, the, the Vance Green family, you know, have, have suffered a tremendous loss. I did not know Raymond um, before this, but you certainly, we both feel like we, we know him now. Yeah. Um, from you know, from the family and all of all of the things we've heard, I cannot imagine uh, Colorado Springs Pride, June tenth and eleventh. All of America will be uh, cheering the LGBTQ community in this Pride Festival, uh, cheering Rich Fierro, who's going to lead the parade as Grand Marshal. I just can't imagine uh, him leading and being Grand Marshal in the parade, um, and and the story of Club uh, Club Q and what happened and for him to lose uh, uh, his daughter's uh, partner. It's just, uh, it's just an incredible, incredible story. One other thing that I think yeah. is really interesting that I want to talk about, uh, and, and we haven't heard as much on it as, as I think should be discussed. Of course, we've already mentioned it was the night before TDOR, which is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. But what happened in the next days after Club Q was very, very interesting and important for LGBTQ community and understanding those people that hate our community. When reports began coming in in the first days, uh, there was reporting going on that the shooter uh, was identified as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, some uh, talking heads in the evening blocks at Fox News even suggested that this was gay or LGBT on LGBT hate and they tried to explain away the gun violence in that we are just a, 
a, um, a community in turmoil, and this is a natural uh, conclusion of that. And at first, evangelical and uh, radical GOP and media uh, were reporting that the shooter was trans. And then it was modified to uh, non-binary. And in some way, this had some effect on the shooting that took place at Club Q and being, and Club Q as the only LGBT embracing bar in Colorado Springs, that was somehow the justification of that. Uh, I, I just want to make sure I give you the opportunity to say loudly and clearly what you think about what happened and this set of facts that I've just outlined, what you think about the shooter. What we happened, I, yeah, what, we ha what happened was hate. It's pure hate. Um, I wasn't there, but I've seen the videos dozens of times. It, 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 there was hate in his eyes. There, there was just pure hate. As far as um, the, the very first time it's ever been reported, the very first time it's ever been noted, that, you know, that there's no, ever, no other evidence on any Facebook or any other writings uh, about non-binary. So the very first time that, that this non-binary piece ever came out about this individual was during his booking at the police station. And so, so we, you know, who, who are we to judge? But, but what does it matter? Um, no, no matter what you are or you're growing up or how you feel, grabbing uh, an assault weapon and mowing down innocent people it, it is unacceptable. It, it's hate. It's hateful. Um, and, and obviously since then, th there's been a lot that's come out about the shooter. Um, you know, it's, it's become apparent that he was actually planning this during our pride. Um, the sketches that, that he did uh, of Club Q um, that were introduced during the preliminary hearings were Club Q's configuration during the pride. And, you know, fortunately, he wasn't able to get his weapons together and get his plan together in that amount of time because again we're looking at this is a person looking to attack a gay venue at pride um this is this is hate and, and and there's nothing else and of course you've probably seen the other media reports during the preliminary hearings that there that there were rifle scopes with the crosses on them pointing to gay prides uh, people you know who are marching in in, in prides um and then other rhetoric that, that's come out. Um, but, you know, the, this this is the, the culture now, that this is a person that grew yeah. up in an anti-gay environment. And specifically to that culture, I, I want to mention this. Uh, let's talk about guns for a minute. Um, uh, Michael, you, I, I listened to some of the words that you, you had on guns and you were really clear. Conservative media and radical GOP in America are certainly using trans, um, uh, drag queens, uh, other related uh, children in our schools, book bans, etc. They're using these topics to weaponize support uh, for agendas that they want, which includes uh, broadening use of guns. And they are whipping up uh, extensions uh, of violence against LGBTQ+. What do you think about where we're at in terms of guns? Uh, you, you sat you were standing behind that bar when you saw um, a military grade weapon used and the hate that was generated uh, and, and ginned up uh, to create a hateful event like that. What do you think about the uh, where we are in guns and how it affects LGBT? Yeah, um, well, I can tell you American citizens are not trained for, for war. They're not trained for um, you know, war type situations here at home. Um, it's so to go through basically warfare in your own city, no one besides the two, uh, Thomas and Rich, I believe were properly prepared for something like that being in the military. Um, but in terms of the LGBTQ, I am quite disgusted with this rhetoric that continues to come out from the right on guns because it's this hate speech and hate rhetoric that is continuing to incite more violence. Yet when the violence happens to us, they make excuses for why the violence has happened. And it's this nasty cycle of, it just continues to feed into itself to create more violence. And particularly in Florida, with all of the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, speech, and legislation, um, and then on top of uh, the governor allowing uh, open carry of weapons without a permit, 
that's a that is a horror situation waiting to happen um america is a unique country in the sense that we're uh the only first world democracy in the western world that has this epidemic of violence that uh this access of guns uh so easily and, and readily available and it's you know once again living through pulse in orlando um being you know just living a few miles away and going to university there and then now being in colorado springs and this happening here it's truly horrific and you have to wonder at what point do our politicians and our government decide that this is a problem that we can do something about besides send thoughts and prayers every time this happens um i've said it a few times but either god doesn't agree with their thoughts and prayers or god isn't listening because nothing is changing that so is i hope at some so point well we can have reform yeah, that is so well uh, said, Michael. And and uh, tragedy of Club Q can't be all uh, tragedy. Uh, there has to be some good news stories that come out of it. And one of them you just talked about. Uh, Michael and uh, Matthew uh, were invited to come to Washington, D.C. They stood up for the entire LGBTQ plus community and testified before Congress um, on uh, the rising danger and violence against LGBTQIA people. Um, what, did, uh, what was your experience like? Tell us, uh, for everybody that's never going to testify before Congress, uh, what was the experience like? Were you treated well? Uh, uh, did they appreciate what you said? Did you felt like you were heard and listened to? Tell us about what the experience was like. It it's an overwhelming experience, obviously. Um, it's an experience that, that, that again, you're, you're not prepared for, certainly so soon after what we had just been through. So we were all still just drinking from the fire hose at that point. But being invited, we felt it was so important, you know, especially on, you know, on, on all, all of us had an individual story. Part of my story there was that the hate was being propagated. We, we yes, we received tens of thousands of letters of support, but we also received hundreds of emails of hate and disgusting. We've got things such as the shooter should never have been disturbed. He was doing God's work, that uh, that Rich was a center for stopping this, that it, this work needs to continue. And that really woke me up to, wow, that this is still in this country. Um, and, and we felt it was very important to tell that story. Um, it, it's, so, so once we did sit down, as, as you know, the, the, the um, that the opposition, the Republicans actually had a statement um, and, and it was one of the most powerful statements because it was just brushing over what was happening, brushing over hate and was just blaming everything on mental illness. Um, and very quickly, Michael and I were, were exchanging notes, changing our speech and uh, <laughs> it, it was it actually gave us someone to direct our, our, our speech to because clearly they didn't understand. Um, but overall, overall, it was a, it was a very positive experience. That there was so much um, love and and, and so, so much so, so much support, even within the capital. You know, people were coming up to us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's it was quite quite an experience to say the least. You know, and and Michael, that was uh, a little bit of an age difference between you and Matthew. I imagine uh, going from the bartender, <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> uh, right? Uh, going from the bartender. <laughs> Uh, at a gay bar to testifying before Congress. That must have been quite a moment for you. Yeah, um, my degree program has been political science and mass media, so I've always understood the government and, and policy and politics, and, um, and you know, I've always been passionate on it. Um, and then to be invited to Congress and to work in collaboration with GLAAD, an organization that I've respected for as long as I can remember, uh, was truly uh, an incredible and a powerful moment. It's it's one of the most, I think, proudest moments of my life to look back oh, on that speech nice. I gave and 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 to just you know so shortly and so soon after the shooting to to be able to go do that. Um, it, it I, I have a lot of uh, uh, proudness for myself because um, that definitely wasn't easy. You know, none of that was so easy. It, it, it was a challenge. It was a mental challenge. Writing the speech was a challenge, not knowing who's going to be in the room and then to go sit down in the House Oversight Committee chamber and to see people you've seen on television for years sitting in front of you. Um, it, it was just a very, very surreal moment. But 
it was that moment that led to a lot of other really positive moments to come, uh, you know, within the last uh, five months. So, you know, it, it, one thing leads to another, but that was definitely the moment I think where me and Matthew both were like, you know, this story has taken on a life of its own and we, we can either rise to the moment or we can run away from it. Yeah. And I'm Michael, glad that I'm we rose curious, to it. Um, uh, as you're testifying in Congress, your political, um, your political science background that you studied. Did you go to UCF, by the way? Is that <clears throat> yes, UCF? Oh, okay, uh, UCF. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> uh, and uh, you're 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 speaking before Congress. Where you, how does it wash over you when I tell you that literally tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of LGBT people are cheering you in the background for what you had the strength to be able to do at Congress? How does that wash over you? Yeah, it, it makes me feel very uh, humbled and very grateful for such a, a large community that we have. And, and you know, when, when I spoke, I directly addressed uh, at a moment the LGBTQ community, telling them that, you know, events like Club Q and events like Pulse are designed to scare us and to make us afraid to live and be who we are openly and proudly. But we can't succumb to that type of fear um, we have to continue living uh, prouder and louder than ever. And so to have that moment and, and to use that that uh, that platform, um, you know, was, I just was very, very inspired by all the support that was coming in. And and I'm glad that I was able to tell my story. Um, and as, besides Matthew, you know, I think that yeah. it was a really powerful moment for us. And, and I, I'm not sure that we realized how big it was or how many were watching as we were doing it again. Part of that was just kind of going through the mo the motions, yeah. you know, having just come off the backs of this tragedy and dealing with this daily and not sleeping and and all of all of those things. Um, but it, it became really clear after the testimony, just walking in the, the halls of the Capitol with people you don't know coming up to you that had just watched it, that the the fact that the White House mm -hmm. called mm -hmm. and said that they had just watched it and you know invited us. Uh, uh, over the next day um, and, and and then we would be walking in airports we could be walking down the road and, and people had seen that that testimony so so I'm, I'm not sure we realized at the moment how, how impactful it was we certainly realize now and yeah. and it's just so important just as Michael said to stand up it's so important there is so much hate out there still we still get letters of this this hate, and and you know everyone lives their lives, and and you know if it doesn't directly affect you, you don't really think about this. And even in our gay community, we we get, we're surrounded by our friends, and we sort of insulate ourselves from this. Mm -hmm. And and this blew up, especially for us, how much hate and division and bullying that there there still is, um, you know, and and suddenly you become hyper aware of it. I, 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 uh, I'm an optimist. I consider myself an optimist. But a long time ago, a uh, very smart, um, actually, theologian uh, said, when they tell you uh, they hate you, your response should be to believe them. <laughs> and when you mention uh, GLAD, <laughs> uh, that's exactly yeah. what GLAD's purpose is. They believe yes. them. And so what are we going to do yes, about it? Yes. So it's a beautiful story and it's it's wonderful that you embrace GLAD because they're one of our most important uh, activist organizations Glad, in America. GLAD was amazing. Again, you imagine deer in the headlights, you go a day without sleeping, you get a phone call from this organization that says, we want to fly two people in and just help you. And, um, and this is the very next day and really didn't know who they were. And again, what are you processing? But yes, we need help. Yeah. And um, two, uh, two, two GLAD members flew in and literally just kind of cocooned us in, in yeah, love yeah. And, and helped yeah. understand how the press situation was going and helped it take that off of us. And, you know, and so the press had a place to go and, and it allowed us to breathe. And so, so it was starting that process. And GLAD is still you know, in our lives almost daily. Yeah. Um, we have direct contact with them and that they're able to help us with so much uh, and we're able just to bounce. I mean, just even just personal support yeah. Yeah. that they've been exactly. there. And so yeah. that entire team is magical and so necessary in this country. Yeah, never a better endorsement of GLAD have I ever heard and I'm really happy to hear that. One <laughs> other great thing uh, that comes uh, out of this and your experience in Washington, you mentioned it, but I have to ask you about it. You get to meet President Joe Biden and Vice President uh, Kamala Harris. What was that experience like? It, 
again, overwhelming. Um, I had received a phone call from President Biden on um, on Thanksgiving Day, and he spent about 20 minutes with me on the phone at that point, and what a personable person he was. I mean, asking questions and, and really just relaying stories. And, and so, so that, that in itself was impressive and, and meant so much and being able to relay that to others meant so much. And he followed that phone call up with a letter. But then to actually hear from the White House, hey, we've just watched your testimony. We would like to invite you. And, and what they did is they invited us to the uh, to the Christmas party, which that in itself, we thought, wow, that's you know amazing. And of course, there's a whole process to get into the White House, which, you know, who knew any, any of that? We yeah. certainly didn't. Um, and, and so we thought, wow, that, that, that's impressive enough. So you're at the White House Christmas party. And then just as Biden was about to speak, they, they came to us and took our cell phones and moved us out of, out of the room into another holding room. And uh, after his speech, um, well, first of all, it was uh, Dr. Biden came in first and, again, just just embraced us with, with love. They fully knew the story that they, I mean, that they, they'd been following it personally. Um, and then after uh, Dr. Biden, then um, the president came in and immediately, again, you just felt such genuine passion and hurt. He was hurting for us. He knew the, the folks that had been killed. He knew the story. He was able to relate to us some personal experiences as well mm -hmm. about his grandfather. And and it didn't feel rushed. It felt so genuine um, and so important. And of course, we were able to talk about the assault weapon ban as well, which is the forefront of all of our minds. And, and you know, had anyone asked, should the shooter have a weapon, you know, from grandparents to parents to friends? The answer is no. And so something has to be done along that line. And and, and the president is so, so passionate about that. Mm -hmm. And yes. Michael, for you, again, uh, you're now vice president of operations uh, uh, and helping to guide the memorial coming, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and the reopening of, of Club Cube. But you were the bartender <laughs> that night behind the bar when this happens. And... Uh, you're now in the White House uh, with uh, the President and Vice President of the United States. Yeah, that's uh, that's a totally normal transition. Yeah, <laughs> bartender to White House. That's that was very regular and normal. Um, no, it, yeah, I mean, I've always respected and, and to a point idolized the office of the President ever since I was a kid, fascinated with politics and how everything worked. And, you know, I, I wasn't certain that that moment was going to come to fruition where we got to have that that holding meeting with him. But, um, you know, when it became evident that it was going to happen, I was wondering why they had given us uh, endless access of champagne prior to this meeting, because then I'm just nervous even more than I should have been. Uh, but, uh, you know... My, it's been my father's dream my whole life to, to go to the White House. He's always just been uh, ca Both captivated. Both your parents are and, alive and, so, and they got to see this? Yeah, yes. Oh. Um, so feels. so my whole, you know, growing up, my dad was always like, when you're president, you have to let me stay in the White House. Um, and I'm like, you're crazy. But anyway, to, to give him that phone call in D.C. that we would be going in the White House, um, uh, he was just very emotional about it. And he was just you know, so struck and he's like, Michael, you're, you're living some one of my biggest dreams ever. Um, and, you know, it was just surreal. I mean, to have the president of the United States walk into the room uh, that you're standing in to come chat with you is uh, definitely not uh, a normal experience. So once again, there's, I feel like there's not a guidebook to any of this. Uh, so we just kind of figure it out as we go. And I think it, I mean, it was such a humbling experience. We, we were alone. So once they took us into the, the holding space, waiting for the president, we had some time alone there and, and they, they did bring out um, some champagne and, and just, it was able, it was, it was such a powerful time for us because here we were at the White House, but that wasn't really what we were thinking about. It, we were thinking about the, the people that were, that were lost, the people that were still in the hospital, our friends. And, and, you know, we were able to talk about, you know, how would Derek and how would Daniel feel about this? And you know, here we are representing them because we know that they would have done it for us if that was us in the, you know, on the I, other side. I, I want to so jump passionate. in. I want to jump in on that observation because um, we're LGBT. We're, we're used to 
uh, hate coming from various quarters. Uh, you know, Matthew and and our age, my age and Matthew's age, we've we've experienced <laughs> quite a bit <laughs> through, right uh, uh, through the years. It's interesting to me those that would uh, hate on you would say, oh, well, this is a very selfish moment that you're talking about. And my reaction is, oh, wait, you are totally missing it. Because the time that both of you got from the president and the vice president is uber and ultimate respect for the entire LGBTQ community. You're just the representation Absolutely. of that. Oh, and that's a yes, beautiful was... story. No, 100%. We felt, I mean, just from the testimony to being there, this wasn't about us. We, The last place we wanted to be that day was there um, because had you know had we been living our normal lives and this not happened we wouldn't be nowhere near the white house yeah and and so it, it was so important to us to to the entire experience to understand why we were there and and that was the forefront of our mind we were still grieving you know derek had been a friend of mine for 12 years an employee of ours for eight years we traveled together daniel had had made such a difference and and then getting to know the families and of the other victims and and our friends that were still in the hospital it it, it just it was overwhelming it was overwhelming with emotion it, it you know these were emotional times anyway um and then having all of this happen and to be able to state their names and to be able to bring their pictures and to be able to bring their story to that white house where so much has happened mm -hmm. and to the president of the united states and and mm -hmm. later to the vice president um is so powerful and and th there's not one thing we've done that their names are not mentioned and this is not done in yeah. their honor mm -hmm. yeah you know one of the things that i learned from pulse and watching so many people that were much much closer to it uh, than me is you go through this shame uh, you go through this process of even the attention you f feel shameful uh, for and and that really is not real and and you have an obligation to continue to represent Club Q and to the survivors and remember those that were injured and especially those that were lost and to represent your entire community and your moment at the White House uh, was a reflection of that so congratulations to you the last thing i want to talk about is uh, of course uh, super important the club has club q has revealed uh, that it now has a plan for the memorial commemorating it to victims of the november uh, shooting and uh, michael had a quote uh, that we thought was very interesting and i i want to uh, share that with you michael said we hope the plan memorial will be finished over the summer with the club reopening in the fall. After decades in Colorado Springs, we want Club Q to be back as a safe place, safe place for members of the community. This memorial will feature, a, uh, will feature five 15-foot pillars for the victims that lost their lives and 17 boulders around the memorial for those that were injured by gunshot. I want Club Q to be back as a safe place place for members of the community that will be remembered decades from now lovely quote and quote uh gentlemen tell me about the memorial what are you planning to do uh you you actually read it um i'll back you up just just for a minute here um directly after this incident the first thing the press are saying days after will you reopen what are you going to do and, and you just don't know you just don't know um and in, inside the difficult thing is to reopen and the difficult thing is to build and remember um but we very about 10 days afterwards the, the amount of support and love and people saying please 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 you must do something um it, it just became very apparent to us that we felt we wanted to and that we were missing the club. And what is very important with me owning this property is that there is no way Club Q could reopen and not tell this story. This is a story of hate, but this is more than that. This is a story of a community coming back together. This is a story of five people losing their lives and a whole community and a whole country behind them and knowing them. And so um, we we went to designers, and and also what was very important to us is that um, that we we've had a temporary memorial, and that memorial has been so impactful for me. Um, I would you know there every single day at the beginning of this, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people coming every single day. Flowers, you know, I mean 
10 feet deep. Uh, it was just tremendous. And I'm listening, and I would listen quietly to what people were saying. And people would bring their, their children, and they would say, this is why you can't bully. This is what happens um, if you're bullying people. It's okay to be different. And that's where I saw this needle starting to move and felt that it was so important that this momentum must continue. And, you know, I have a 21-year-old son. I expect his children to understand what happened. It's very important to me that the story of, of our employees that were lost, the stories of our customers that were lost continues and that you cannot just sweep this sort of hate underneath the, the rug or just move on or just rebuild and, and, and their lives were incremental. This was what happens when you allow hate to propagate. This is what happens when you don't stand up and people are hating around you. This is what happens when you vote and don't think about who and what you're voting for. And for us, we felt that, that there had to be something. And so the most important thing for me is this memorial. And there will not be one day that goes by that there is not something that remembers. And so we're planning that, you know, our temporary memorials in front of the building. Well, we need to do construction at the building, but we need to first get our memorial done. And and that, that that's what we're raising money for. People asked, how can you help? And, and what we want people to help with is help with this this memorial because that sends the message of anti-hate you know when you buy a tile that that's going to be displayed there with your message on it or, or when you make a donation um and you know big or small it all makes a difference because that is the community saying it's not us building this memorial it is the community building this memorial mm -hmm. and making very very clear that for decades to come this is remembered this is what happens you know when you I, I'm sorry, I, I was also going to ask, in addition to that, uh, Michael, you're, you're, again, I keep coming back to this, you're standing behind the bar as bartender when this, this tragic event happens. Um, uh, you're going to reopen uh, Club Q. Uh, it's going to be the safe space uh, that it always has been for the last two decades. Uh, what went into the decision to say, nope, uh, we're going to reopen the doors and we're going to invite uh, the entire community back. What went What went into that decision? Yeah, I think it goes into the theme of, um, you know, hate will never overcome love. It will never overcome community. Um, you know, and the community, there's so many people hurting right now that don't have somewhere to gather to process and heal with others. I know that once Club Q is completely remodeled and renovated, it will provide people a new place to come to to once again gather and and hopefully continue the healing process of moving past this but i don't want those five minutes of hate that took place on november 19th to uh overshadow the 20 years of community that club q has provided um i've only been in it a fraction of that time but even in that fraction of time, it's been such an impactful and important place for me. And there's a hole in the community right now. And, you know, it, the community is missing its home. The community is missing its gathering point. And I think it's very, very important that everything we do is done respectfully and right. And that's why these things do take more time than we'd like them to. But once it's done, you know, we fully believe uh, that it will become a very healing moment for, for everybody. Well, it's coming uh, this fall. Club Q is going to reopen. Uh, if you want to help and support this uh, memorial, go to Club Q online or any of their social media. There's lots and lots of information uh, on the entire program. And uh, when you talk about uh, your reaction of how slow this is moving, I would remind you back to your roots uh, at UCF in Orlando, uh, we still do not have a memorial for Pulse in Orlando. Yeah. Seven years later. So congratulations yeah. to both of you. You're moving at light speed. Uh, last thought uh, that I want to personally suggest, I never thought that I would do an interview like this or an interview like this would happen. I was so harmed by the events of June 12, 2016 and Pulse. It's, it's hard for me with Pulse coming up on a seventh anniversary um, to say how hard it's been. I have been to the temporary memorial at Pulse site more than a dozen times uh, since the shooting. I knew uh, a Club 
Q was possible. I just knew it. I didn't know that uh, talking to Michael and uh, Matthew uh, was possible in relation to a Club Q. And I remind everybody, this week Georgetown Law School issued an emergency bulletin about guns and safety for the upcoming June Pride Month. I am broadcasting the Stonewall Pride Parade on June 17th live on Roku and Apple Television with my broadcast partner, Faye Watt. I'll be thinking on that day of Club Q and the entire LGBTQ community of Colorado Springs, just as I do of Pulse and Orlando. Pride and June Pride Month is not negotiable. Pride parades in light of Pulse, conservative politics, and Club Q. This year, our June Pride Month really needs to be a protest. They now should Great. be a protest. Great. Michael Anderson, Matthew, uh, Haynes, what uh, admirable and inspiring uh, to meet both of you, and we'll continue to follow your story. And thank you very much for being with us tonight uh, at Queer News tonight. Al, thank you very much for having yes. us. Thank you.